Kwe, bonjour, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's event, where we will explore Indigenous policy making in Canada. So we know that during these uh, very strange times that we're going through, uh, people are overwhelmed and you're very busy. So we really want to thank you for being here today and for joining us for this event. Uh, my name is Nathalie Gagnon, and I'm the Associate Director at Reach and Engagement for Indigenous Learning at the Canada School of Public Service. I'm happy to welcome you to today's discussions. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that since I am in the National Capital Region, uh, I'm on the traditional uh, territory of the Anishinaabeg people. I recognize we all work in different places and that you work in a different traditional territory, so I encourage you to take a few moments to think about that. So before we start, there's always a few administrative details we have to go through, and that will make our experience a, a better experience. So um, in order to optimize your viewing, and we recommend that you disconnect from VPN, and if possible, that you could also use a personal device to watch the session. We do have simultaneous translation or interpretation available during the event, so everyone can participate in the language of their choice. So during the event today, we'll be taking questions also through the Collaborate video interface. Please go to the top corner of your screen, and it's on the top right, and click the Participate button and enter your questions along with your email. Depending on the discussions and the questions, we may have the opportunity to get to all of your questions, but we might not also. So we'll do the best that we can to answer as many questions as possible. So if everybody's welcome, uh, ready, let's get started with our panel discussion. So I would like to welcome today's speakers. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention that one of our speakers, Isa Grunli, is unfortunately not able to be with us today, but we know that she's with us in spirit. So Isabel Quintal has agreed to join us instead. Isabel has been Director of Strategic Policy Planning and Result at Child and Family Services Reform at Indigenous Services Canada since August 2019. She is responsible for the implementation of an act respecting First Nation, Inuit, and Métis children, youths, and families. From 2016 to 19, she was Chief of Staff to the Assistant Secretary, Regulatory Affairs at uh, Treasury Board Secretariat of Canada, where she provided advice to the Secretary on regulatory matters, engagement, and inter internal management. Prior to that, Isabelle held various positions in the Privy Council Office. In her last position, she was Senior Advisor to the Clerk of the Privy Council on Engagement. She holds a Bachelor's Degree in Foreign Languages and a Bachelor's Degree in Political Science, International Relations. She's also the mother of two boys and the stepmother of three other children, all between the ages of 7 to 16 years old. So, you're very busy, Isabel. We, we realize that, and thank you for being here. Um, the next person I'd love to introduce is Danielle White. She's Director General Evaluation and Policy Redesign Branch, Strategic Policy and Partnership Sector for Indigenous Services Canada. So Danielle is original, originally from New Kuknek, Dahamam Cook, and I'm pretty sure I did not say it well, the community of St. George's, Newfoundland. Danielle is of Mi'kmaq and European ancestry and is a member of the Kualipu First Nation. She has over 20 years of experience in the federal public service, including leadership roles in policy, communications, and human resource, resources in several departments. Most of them primarily focus on Indigenous policy. Uh, Danielle joined Indigenous Services Canada in October 2018 as a Director General of Evaluation and Policy Redesign, where she's focused on horizontal and innovative partnerships and approaches to advance the transfer of jurisdiction and control over services back to Indigenous communities. The last person I'd like to introduce is Candice saint aubain And during her career as a public servant, she has had the opportunity to lead, leg lead legislative amendments to the Indian Act to address gender inequality, represented various departments before House of Commerce and Senate, Senate committees, and has represented Canada internationally in areas related to reconciliation and lifelong learning. Candice has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in Canadian studies with a focus on Indigenous children's rights. She's Anishinaabe and spends her free time with her family enjoying the outdoor, kayaking and hiking with their dogs. Um, Candice is also vice president of the Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Prevention Branch at the Public Health Agency of Canada. 
As for myself, I am an Anishinaabeg, but I was raised in Wabanaki territory in New Brunswick. I have over 30 years experience in policy making, managing major projects and running organizations related to Indigenous people, women and youth, mostly in the uh, non-for-profit sector. Most of my public service career has been with the Parks Canada Agency and the Indigenous Affairs Branch. However, since June 2019, I've been with Indigenous Learning at the Canada School of Public Service first as the Associate Director for Departmental Support and Research, and currently as Associate Director of Outreach and Engagement. So thank you very much for being here, uh, ladies. I'm very happy that we'll be having this discussion today. So in order to frame the discussion, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to set the stage and provide some background information, uh, very high level information on Indigenous policy making in Canada. And I suspect that as we go through the discussions later on, uh, that we'll be able to add to this. So, uh, second slide, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a very, 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 very brief history of Indigenous and Crown relations, but I think it's really important to have that in the back of our minds as we're speaking today about the future, especially of Indigenous policy making. So we can look at the, the um, relationships between Indigenous and Crown uh, in three, as three separate uh, relationships. When we, with the newcomer relationship, which was very much Indigenous people, First Nation, and later Inuit and Métis, um, they did distinctly according to their own political, economic, and spiritual structures, and they had their own relationships with the land and the water. As the colonial government came in and they developed alliances, they're very much alliances uh, based on economic opportunities and so on. And then uh, as things started to change, the relationship uh, became a relationship more of military for military control for North America as the wars between the French and the English uh, were developing. So in order to have the strategic alliances with First Nations, the Crown decided to sign uh, treaties with Indigenous nations. And we have to remember that treaty making was also something that was very well known uh, in, uh, in Turtle Island at the time. So everybody understood what they were going into, but they might have understood, differently understood why they were going into it or, or what, they were, uh, what the reasons for them were. That after the wars changed very rapidly to what we would call legislated assimilation. So through the British North American Act, um, the Crown retained exclusive legal control over Indians and lands reserved for the Indians. They started to, the Crown started to introduce laws and policies um, and made the uh, First Nations, you know, later the Inuit and the Métis, they stripped them of their rights and made them wards of the states. Along with that came other policies that were quite detrimental uh, to Indigenous peoples. So with the creation of the Department of Indian Affairs, uh, we saw the rise of the residential school system, the newly imposed ban election system, which was completely different from how uh, Indigenous peoples uh, govern themselves, the criminalization of Indigenous uh, religious or spiritual practices, and also of cultural practices. Um, and other, quite a lot of other policies that we won't go through here implemented by the Indian agents. So through all of this, as the years progress, what we saw was uh, the, um, the indigenous nations were slowly being destroyed because of political, economic and spiritual structures that were not theirs to be able to control. Next slide. So this slide, I think, is important for us to understand because some of the, um, as I talk to friends, I'm always amazed uh, to realize that a lot of people don't understand the fact that most uh, Indigenous people, uh, First Nation, Inuit, and Métis, fall under federal uh, jurisdiction and no, not necessarily provincial jurisdiction. And because of that, that is why what we're going to be talking about today is so important for us, so that we understand that we have such an important role to play in policy making. So some of the examples of the federal control of indigenous peoples were 
you know, education, taxation, the legal system, uh, child welfare and health, which some of them normally would be uh, provincial, as I mentioned. Um, and the, 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 the important thing to remember about this is the impact that that had on uh, the three groups. So for First Nation, it was complete control by the Indian Egypt from the past system to uh, inability to enter into contracts or even to sell their products the way they wanted to and sometimes forced enfranchisement, which meant that they did not retain their uh, Indian status. For the Inuit, for the longest time, it was just neglect. We did not really care that the Inuits were there. Uh, but when we started looking to the north, uh, either for expansion or for territorial reasons, um, we started replacing the, the Inuit names with what they call the Eskimo Dis. And they, they, we had forced relocation, we had dog slaughter, and quite a few other, other policies that happened also at the time. For the Métis, uh, we often excluded them from the treaties, but not all of them. There are some treaties where the Métis are uh, involved, so that's important to, to realize. But there's also a lack of recognition and marginalization of uh, that cultural group. Uh, but on the other hand, we still send them to residential schools and uh, treated them sometimes uh, as we treated uh, First Nations. So what's the role of the federal, po federal policy making? Uh, just to remind everybody, and this I, again, as I mentioned at first, this is very high level. So policy making is very much deciding who gets the resources. So we're deciding what, how, why, when, and where those resources are going to be distributed. So developing policy for the public service, it contributes to, identif to the identification, the maintenance, and the expression of Canadian values. And this is very important. We're talking about Canadian values. What we value becomes what we, get, we give people, how we give people, why we give it the resources, and so on. And it's also through the administration of government programs. Um, the public policies in their nature can be either facilitating, regulatory, or restrictive. And in some cases, uh, that's very much needed if they're regulatory or restrictive, but sometimes it can be to the detriment of the people who are going to be um, receiving those policies. So basically what we have to realize as policy uh, advisors, I always have a tendency of saying policy makers, which we're not, the political, our political masters are the policy makers, is the policies institutionalize relationships among groups in society. They have a direct impact on the recipient and they're based on our major societal values. So that's very important to remember. Next slide. Just also a reminder about Section 35 of the Constitution, and I won't read this, but uh, hopefully, uh, if you don't know it, it would be a good thing to go see it. So the interesting about the Canadian Constitution is that the first 34 sections are about uh, the our Charter of Rights and Responsibilities. And right after that, we start with Aboriginal and, and Treaty Rights, which is really important. So it's front and center of our Constitution. Another thing that's really interesting that a lot of people don't realize is the Métis in our constitution. We're the only constitution in the world that has Métis as recognized as a people. So that is because um, we recognize that they're a distinct society that came before the crown actually took control of the land. So what is the, the purpose of section 35? It's to reconcile those existing or subsequent treaties with the interest of all Canadians. That is basically what it is. We need to try to reconcile those, uh, whether it's societies, laws, governments, and territories of Indigenous people with the interests of the rest of Canada. It's not always easy, but it can be very interesting and very uh, rewarding. One of the things that's really interesting about the Constitution also is that Section 35 is one of the only sections in the Constitution that has never actually had a whole of government policy framework to institute or to implement this section. So if you think about that, that's very important. So that means that we've basically been doing either piecemeal or we've been trying to implement this uh, depending on 
the political will as, uh, as they were decided at the time, instead of looking at a whole of government policy to implement it. So this is what we need to talk about in the future. Next slide, please. So basically what's been happening because of that is that the law and not the policy has been driving our relationships between the Crown and the Indigenous people. And how has it been driving it? Well, until recently, the policies, if you remember, I mentioned they were either uh, restrictive or enabling and whatever. So in this case, the policies have been assimilationist and restrictive, mostly because of the Indian Act. So instead of looking at the Constitution to develop the policies, we looked at the Indian Act. The Indian Act is an act and it's important, but the, the Constitution supersedes the Indian Act. So in the absence of federal policy, uh, what has happened is that Indigenous peoples have gone to the, have gone to the courts to get their rights defined. And the courts have stated repeatedly and repeatedly that the Crown needs to step in into that policy void and that the Crown needs to work with Indigenous groups to develop those policies. And it, this, has, this has been going on for quite a long time. And now the Crown is that the, the courts are giving more and more uh, strong remedies towards Indigenous groups who are going to the courts because of this. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the courts have said, please start talking together to negotiate this. Um, it needs to be rigorously and honorably implemented. And the recognition of rights is essential for rec reconciliation to happen. We need to start there. So we need to understand that First Nation, Inuit and Métis are part of the constitutional framework. Uh, that the self-determination is important. That Indigenous languages and cultures are central, very central to the well-being of those communities. And that Indigenous people have a very unique and constitutionally protected link and interest to their lands and, and resources and territories. Next slide. So looking forward, because that's what we want to talk about today. Looking forward, what are we, what are we looking at? There's three really important things that are going to be drivers for us as we move forward. Um, the Prime Minister has often mentioned the recognition, um, respect of rights, cooperation and partnership. I call it the three RCP, so I don't forget it. That is all about recognizing Section 35 and about implementing Section 35. The other one is how we're going to uh, implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in a modern context and within our own Canadian expression. And the third one, we have a lot, uh, we have at least three or four really interesting um, either documents, but also, you know, people have thought about this a lot. So the principles respecting the government of Canada's relationship with Indigenous people which if you don't have not read it yet, please go on the Canada website and find it and read it. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions, which are really important. And also the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls to justice. And because of these, our approach needs to change. We know that it needs to change, but how are we going to do that? Next slide. One of the first things that happened was dissolving INAC. <clears throat> So um, RCAF, which was the, uh, uh, oh, I forgot what our, Danielle is going to tell well, me no. the humans. <laughs> Sorry. Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. Thank you. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. One of the recommendations was dismantling, uh, dismantling the uh, Department of Indian Affairs and having two separate uh, departments. And this is what happened recently. So why, why has this happened? It's because the two departments, although uh, they're divided structures, the mandates are very complementary, and they're very important to how we're going to move forward in our relationships. So CERNAC, or Crown Indigenous Relation Northern Affairs, their title explains it. They're there to manage the relationships with Indigenous people and Indigenous groups, and also to work on Northern Affairs. Ind Indigenous Services Canada, they're there to offer services or to, be, to work with Indigenous groups to develop services uh, as, and 
also including those transferred from Health Canada and to devolve the, those services towards communities eventually. Um, as one, uh, one person that I used to work with at East says, we're here to make sure that our department disappears eventually, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, next slide, please. So the minister's mandates letters. Read your minister's mandate letters. It's really important because in there, there's a whole of government approach on how reconciliation should be implemented. And each minister has a, a specific uh, mandate that is, uh, that is specified in their letter. The concept of nothing about us without us, that's what we mean when we talk about relationships. Co-development, how do we do co-development in this world where we have memorandums to CAD and the treasury board submissions and so on, and that we have to make sure that uh, the debates that happen in cabinets remain uh, secret to cabinet. And what does it mean when you're talking about a distinctions-based approach? So are we looking at multiplying different programs or are we looking at how the experiences from different uh, Indigenous nations are, are supposed to shape our policies and programs? Next slide. Let's look towards the future. So that's the discussion we're going to have today. So we're going to talk about how First Nations, Inuit and Métis are the foundations of the constitutional framework and how that means that we're, we're looking for a just and respectful society, how we're looking towards self-determination and, and how can we do that. Promoting and, and preserving Indigenous languages and cultures, as I mentioned, and looking at the unique connection that Indigenous people have to their land and building awareness. Keep, we need to keep building awareness about the legacy of the residential schools. It, the last one closed in 1999. So the, the, the generation that was there is still alive today and is, is probably close to, close to a, a lot of people that we know. Next slide. So I'm hoping that this is going to give us some hope. So with truth and understanding, there's true reconciliation. With honor and recognition of treaties, there's true reconciliation. With new laws and new policies, there's true reconciliation. But with credible action also, we need credible action to have uh, true reconciliation. So that's the end of uh, my presentation. Um, like I said, if you need more information, please don't hesitate to go on our website and uh, and uh, find some information. We have a new app that we've just developed and that app is, uh, is there for people who, uh, who want to learn a, few, a bit more and we have courses and also. So that was a shameful plug for us. So we have three amazing panelists with us today who have so much experience when we come to, when it comes to Indigenous policy makings. So now I want to just give them give them the space so that they can give us some in, uh, information. So would anybody like to share their thoughts about the presentation? And is there something that maybe I should have emphasized more that I didn't? Um, and would you like to talk about maybe uh, your, as your career in the public service, um, if you can give us examples of uh, policy making that you've been involved in, that would be really awesome to hear about. Who wants to go first? Candice? Hi, thank you. Can you hear me, Natalie? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. No, thank you for that. Merci beaucoup, miigwech. Um, hello, everybody who's here and listening and, and uh, about to participate in, in, uh, in the open to question, opening up to questions from, from folks out there as well. Um, you know, Natalie, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. I think it did set a nice foundation and a framework, um, and certainly the historical context of where we were really from a, a legislative uh, and constitutional point to some very interesting times as where we are now. Um, and you know, my, my colleagues who are around around on the screen, as it were, uh, can probably speak to the some of the big instrumental change that we've seen in the public service within the last, I want to say, you know, between you know five to ten years, the fundamental shift uh, of late, where we really are being pushed uh, 
certainly push from the political side to to make change, to do things different than how we've always done. Um, certainly in the construct of co-development, which I've had some opportunity to be a part of both in my, I worked for ESDC and I did uh, Indigenous Skills and Employment Training uh, Program, which went through a massive um, retooling, certainly co-developed with the lens of distinctions based. Um, but I, it was, it was really a different way of doing business of how we do business and policy. We tend to do policy like, you know, in our, in our little spaces. Yes, we'll reach, I'll call Danielle up on the phone and I'll be like, we're writing this policy. You know, what do you guys have to think? What are your thoughts on this? Do you have anything to add? And we'll kind of work in that method, but never really going outside uh, and saying, giving the pen over, if you will, to, to my First Nations, Inuit, Métis partners, those living in urban space. Um, so that was a really fundamental shift. And I think the one thing I probably would be interested in touching on, certainly if we have those conversations, really the systemic change that we had to do internally to government. My experience has been, and including with the, the change, the you know, legislative amendments to the Indian Act, and when I did education and now as, a, as the ADM at, uh, at the public health agency is, we have been our own barrier we have structures and we've become accustomed to these rigid structures that we don't, you know, that innovation that we're constantly being pushed for was hard for us to achieve. And especially around program and policy. And instead of saying, well, we can't, well, why can't we? So it's, it's changing. It's like that fundamental paradigm shift internal to government uh, as policy writers and, and thinkers and, and sort of strategic advice, uh, advice and tactical advice, we tend to be, well, I think it's changing, but you know, I, hopefully with new generation of policy folks coming in and program folks coming in, um, that they're really keen and energized to kind of think out of the box and not be afraid. We have, yes, you know, terms and conditions and rules and policies, blah, 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 but they're pretty flexible. We've just tended to scope them really tight because we just because we always have. So I think, you know, looking at your frame as the bigger Canadian constitutional framework, in terms of the public service, it would be interesting to take a pause and reflect on how we're our own kind of worst enemy when it comes to making kind of that transformational change, if you will. And, and I'm seeing Danielle nod because I'm sure she's probably thinking like, oh my gosh, yes, isk. I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you set that up perfectly because I, I, you know, similar reflections. And I think, Natalie, in your presentation, you covered really well, um, you know, the fundamentals. And I think if there were two things that I would really emphasize and that I hope people can take away from that is, is number one, the relationship uh, and that historic relationship as, as the foundation of, of everything we do today. Um, you know, and as public servants, we're representatives of the crown in a relationship that goes back to 1763. So that predates you know, the creation of, of Canada itself, uh, and then the weight of history that comes with that relationship and, and, you know, both the good and the bad, and in particular, the history of broken promises, assimilationist policies, that's something that we carry with us uh, as representatives of the Crown to this day. Um, and then the second piece, which I think is perhaps less well understood, although we're getting there, is, is the idea, is the importance of rights uh, at the foundation of, of the relationship. And when we're working with Indigenous peoples in policymaking, we're working with rights holders, not stakeholders. And I think that's, that's again, a really important point is to understand the, you know, um, the impact of those rights and, and in defining the relationship and how we work together. And I think that's what makes Indigenous policymaking fundamentally different than, than other areas of federal policy. In terms of, you know, looking back on, on, um, you know, what, how we've seen things evolve. Um, I, I can't claim this as an original thought, but I have a colleague who always refers to kind of, and not just the last 30 years, but if you think of the last 150 years of Indigenous policymaking, that it's kind of been, you know, you can sum it up in four words, to, for, with, by. Uh, things were done to Indigenous people um, to assimilate, to meet the government's objectives, to clear the land for settlement. Things were done, you know, to Indigenous people. Uh, with, you know, followed by the more, you know, the era of the more paternalistic mentality and the rise of the welfare state, things were done for Indigenous people because they, the, you know, the prevailing view was they couldn't do it for themselves. And then I think the era that, you know, where, where my career in the public service started was around that shift to we're doing things with Indigenous people. So we would engage, we would talk about 
um, you know, we would consult, but then we'd kind of still go off and do a little bit of, you know, um, what the, the government needed to be done to the era where we are today, which is really, and into the future, when I think about the mandate of Indigenous Services Canada to, to advance self-determination, to transfer jurisdiction and control, it's, it's policy and programming being done by Indigenous peoples for themselves. So like in, in a nutshell, I think that's how I would summarize. Um, and, you know, I think particularly to the last 20, 25 years, I joined the public service just after the Royal Commission report. And I think, you know, from then to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in 2015 and beyond, um, there have, when you look at it, you know, it, I know we all get frustrated at the pace of progress and the pace of change in, in policy. But when you kind of look back over that horizon, uh, I have seen a lot of things change. I think we've seen a shift from that, you know, more unilateral approach to policy making and that, you know, in the with the federal overriding, what are the federal interests to a much more balanced and bilateral approach. Uh, you know, we've moved from that small C consultation to true co-development in, in many areas. And in parallel, we've seen, you know, the, the legal duty to consult and the jurisprudence around that evolve from, you know, the Haida Taku decision, uh, which has implications, um, not just for policy, but it's, it's fundamentally changed the regulatory process and the regulatory framework in this country. Um, you know, how governments organize themselves to make decisions in terms of some of the big machinery changes, obviously the creation of ISK and CERNA is one, um, but, um, you know, and how we engage with Indigenous partners. So we, you know, there was an era from, you know, Kelowna in 2006 to the Crown First Nations gathering in 2012 to then, then the establishment of the permanent bilateral mechanisms. We've had these, you know, a number of starts in terms of how do we work collectively together? How do we define those relationships from kind of more time limited, um, you know, um, big tent approaches to Indigenous policy to a much more enduring uh, sustained focus on the relationship. And so I think through that time, our, you know, the level of ambition has has increased steadily and through all, all governments, you know, really culminating with, um, you know, the current government and, and commitments in every minister's mandate letter, um, and I guess that that's probably the last element that I, I would focus on is, yes, definitely more emphasis on the big structural issues. So from, you know, discrete policies and programs where, you know, INAC was, was INAC and to some extent Health Canada were the, the lead, but many other departments were off doing their own thing uh, in their own silos to a true whole of government approach where it is everybody's responsibility. We're minister, we have now, you know, Starting in the early 2000s, there was a reference group of ministers on Aboriginal policy. That was a time limited thing. Now we have a full cabinet committee on reconciliation. Um, so how we've organized ourselves to, to make decisions, to work with partners has, has really shifted as well. Um, and on those big structural issues, it's now we're talking about the funding relationship. What is the fiscal relationship? So how do we, not just funding for this program or that program, but what are those fundamentals in terms of how we, how we navigate those relationships? We're talking about systemic racism. We're talking about barriers to self-determination and jurisdiction. We're seeing the growth of indigenous-led institutions in the indigenous public sector. So when I, you know, kind of when I look back over the last 25 years, um, you know, it, as you said, it, it does give me a lot of cause for for hope and optimism to see some of those really, really big structural changes that are that are underway. We're far from there. We have a long way to go, but I think, um, you know, the ground has shifted considerably. I think between particularly starting with our cap and culminating with the TRC. Um, we're really in a new era, I think, of Indigenous policymaking. Well, I, I really like the, uh, the two, the two, four, with and by. In my experiences in government, uh, you know, talking to a lot of people, the question that I get most of, most of the time is, but how do we do it? How is the with done? And um, I, I that you're saying that right now, especially in the work that you all three of you are doing, you're probably way up over the with and you're within the by, you know, in the permanent, bi permanent bilateral mechanism structures and so on. But there's still a lot of uh, departments that are still struggling with the with right now. So what would some of the, um, so what were some of the, the, the best practices or, or, or suggestions or recommendations would you make to these departments? If I may jump on this one, uh, yes. with the implementation of the legislation uh, that has a very long name, so an act respecting First Nation, Métis, and Inuit child and family uh, youth. Uh, the reason why it is successful is because we engage uh, early and often. 
the legislation affirms their right, the community's right to exercise jurisdiction. And so that's a big shift right there. We do not recognize it. We are affirming it. So there's no question or do you have it or not. So from the get-go, we establish that they have their right. And so how do they want to ex to actually like take care of their own children? And so by uh, by listening, which is the first thing, and I'm no indigenous. I'm barely, I have barely I have two years in experience with indigenous policy, but it's to have that open minded and understand that what we don't know can fill a warehouse, and that who are we? to actually decide what's best for them. And so by listening, engaging, and it's not questioning, but sometimes like raising issues that we have seen from previous position that are engaging in a dialogue because that's what matters. And that dialogue has to be from the beginning. And it's a continuum. You cannot just say, okay, so for that program, I'm engaging and I'm co-developing because I need, I need involvement and I need co-developing on this. This is a continuum, so it needs to be constant. It also brings the notion of distinction based. Uh, you mentioned that, Nally, in your uh, in your presentation, that not everybody has the same uh, the same experience, and we absolutely need to be conscious of that. The Indian Act is not applied to every Indigenous Métis Inuit are living different uh, reality than First Nation, and as such, you cannot. There's not a one size fit all. And so that continuum conversation and dialogue needs to be at various level and broader because the conversation and what you are actually giving to a community by in involving them and accepting what's best for them will have some repercussion on other program because they see it as domino effect on everything. And this is where as policy advisor, not maker, we need to be conscious of this, that everything is intertwined. And so co-development on one thing will trickle down if we're doing it properly to the broader thing. So this is what, from my very limited experience right now, I've learned so far. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Danielle or Candice, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in. I tried to use my little raise your hand thing. I don't know if that works or not, but <laughs> just, I usually just talk. I, and just to build on what you were saying, Isabel, I think you've made some really good points too. In all transparency, like, so I've been in the government, not, not as long as some, but certainly long enough and, you know, worked in various program policy, et cetera. I've struggled um, with a few things when it comes to this new reality. And it's really an, an interesting to hear what folks listening in and where they're struggling is. Um, but it's balancing, when we talk about rights, it's very, um, it's very complicated. Everything's always really complicated. But so it's, it's when you're, when you're thinking about, you know, how you're going to write a particular policy or how you want to, you know, how, when you have these conversations, it's a balance between the collective right versus the individual right. And I, that can flat out when it comes to any identity issues. Um, so especially when you're talking about distinction space policy, that even gets messier. But that's normal. And you know, and I think that because we're so used to and going back to the kind of the rigidity that we've worked in for so long with our rigid frameworks that we're stuck to and bound to, it, it, it just doesn't make sense in this new world. It has to be very fluid and flexible and really, and like Natalie said, you can't just talk to the NIOs. Like, I'm sorry, gone are the days. Yes, it's easier. Certainly, if you're a minister, it's much easier just to speak to one particular, because how am I going to speak to, you know, 900, you know, sorry, that was a terrible, I don't know which ministers I was impersonating, but I'm just saying. Um, so you have to be able to connect with communities uh, and understand that even within certain communities, they're not going to agree and you'll never make everybody happy. And also, I have some challenges with the concept of co-development because co-development means that there's two people developing. So when we're saying buy, that's not a co-development. That's a scenario. We're just, do we just provide them with tools and say, here you go, 
because we're, and again, co-development is morphing right now. Co-development coming in. I am an officer of the queen. You know, like I, I know who, where my paycheck comes from. And I know that I do have authorities and rules that I do need to follow. Uh, but it's trying to, how can I extricate myself from this job and giving the tools to those communities to form it? That's kind of my version of co-development. You know, where before it was like, we have the federal voice, you have the indigenous First Nations and you at Métis, non-status, all that other gray zones. Like, it, how do you co-develop together? So these are the things that I have struggled with. And really, there's never one answer. It depends on where you are and the time that you're at and the topic you're working on. I, I would agree with that. And I think, um, you know, part of the, the challenge is there is no one size fits all. There is no how to guide <laughs> to do this, sadly. Uh, if I could write the code, you know, if I could write the book on co-development, I, I could probably retire now, but you know, there you go. It's not, uh, uh, it's not that simple and it is going to vary. It's going to, and it's going to, it's going to be, you know, context specific, it's going to be specific to the Indigenous group you're working with, and whether it's a national, regional, local group, whether it's First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and it's going to be subject matter specific. So if you're in a department and you're looking to develop, you know, a pan-Canadian national strategy on innovation, Indigenous people are obviously going to have interests and priorities, um, but that's a different type of, of exercise. Um, than when we're talking about drawing down jurisdiction over child and family services, right? And there are certain topics and subject matters that are going to be much more fundamental to, to the identity, to the self-determination aspirations of Indigenous peoples. And so, uh, and then sometimes, you know, their priorities aren't going to match the government's priorities in terms of the timing and sequencing and what needs to happen when. And so, you know, but I think my experience, particularly in my previous role when we were establishing the Reconciliation Secretariat with a whole of government focus, we were setting up the permanent bilateral mechanisms with First Nations and Inuit and Métis partners, which interestingly enough, all evolved quite differently in terms of how those processes are structured and what the priorities are. And they've all kind of taken on their own um, character. You know, some of the things that I learned were you know, the importance of building trust and building relationships and not just in the boardroom. Um, who can remember the last time any of us were in a boardroom anyway? But, you know, some of my, I think, most uh, important experiences were on the ground in communities, um, you know, sitting in, in uh, at Batosh, Saskatchewan with the Associate Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs and my ADM and Métis leadership in someone's trailer over Soup and Bannock starting to carve out having that beginning of a conversation uh, that got to a multi-million dollar settlement for the mistreatment of Métis veterans two years later. So it's, it's, it's being, you know, meeting people where they are and having those experiences on the ground in communities. And, and I really, you know, I hope when this pandemic is over, we don't um, lose sight of the value of those kinds of relationships. I think that's really important. And I think that, you know, the other piece, it means respecting and making space for our respective decision-making processes. So, you know, we have the cabinet and the budget process and we have, you know, considerations around timing and secrecy and what we can and can't share. Um, so we have to find ways to navigate that, right? And so while we can't guarantee, we have to protect the integrity of the cabinet process, we can't guarantee to our partners what the outcome will be. What we can give assurance and, and commit to and make sure it happens is that ministers will see the products and and the approaches that are co-developed that are co-development and co-developed and that will be part of the advice and that will be part of the information that's provided for decision making, um, not co-writing a memorandum to cabinet, which is a whole you know um, something I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, and at the same time, we have to respect the timing and the decision making of our partners. So, for example, the AFN chiefs and assembly meet twice a year, and that's their opportunity to give the mandate to the national chief. So, uh, and this is where it often puts public servants in, in that tricky position of, you know, you've got a minister who's got a mandate letter and they're super keen and they wanna get going. Sometimes we have to wait for our, our partners to be uh, to be ready to move forward. And so it's, it's there's a certain, I think the federal system is still struggling with how to get comfortable with that letting go of, of our timelines, of our, you know, departmental silos and, and uh, 
vertical accountabilities, um, and then being respectful of the interests and, and also the capacity of our partners, right? The federal, the federal public service is a huge machine. There are 250,000 of us. Um, you know, we may be working with small communities or small organizations that have limited capacity. And so part of the conversation has to be, how can we support that capacity? Um, and then, um, you know, being ready to move at a, at a pace and in a manner that's determined uh, jointly with our partners. You know, so nothing about us without us. There's that tension. Sometimes that has to mean, but not now. And, and we have to take those cues as well. Mm. Yes, nothing about us without us. Yeah. And one of the things that I really agree with you, Danielle, is that I found that you can solve a lot of problems through BANIC. BANIC is really one of the things that can, helps us solve problems, if you have good ones. Um, Yes, I, I like that. And, and I think it makes me, it's making me think about, as you were saying, you know, with and by, with, you know, is co-development, by is, you know, self-determination and, you know, moving towards that goal uh, as federal employees. And it's not always easy because we see it as uh, less as sharing power and more as losing what we believe might be power, which is not really you know, power, but it, it has to be, uh, it has to be shared and, and it has to be, uh, given also. Um, one of the things that I was wondering is last December the, the federal government um, tabled the Bill C-115 regarding uh, the U, uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and I was wondering moving forward how do you think that's going to change your way of working and uh, in our way of looking at Indigenous rights you know because the, the UN is very adamant about the fact that these rights, the, the, the expression of these rights is, it has to be very modern also. And a lot of people still think, you know, that, that rights are the old, old fashioned way of looking at it. So how do you see that you know, working uh, through government and through our policies? Does anybody have uh, some thoughts or ideas on that? Sorry, my unmute wasn't working. Maybe just just a, a quick comment on on Bill C fifteen and and the declaration. I mean, I think it, you know, and I'm I'm far from an expert, but I think it reinforces in law um, many of the practices that are already in place, many of the things that we're already doing around um, you know recognition of rights, co development. Um, I think the other you know popular misconception is it, the declaration isn't just about free prior and informed consent and resource development in the resource sector and there's been a predominant focus um, on that but I think if, if you as you said in your presentation if you read through the whole declaration you'll see there are important provisions about the right to self-determination and the right of indigenous peoples to be involved in decision making in in, in subject matters that that affect them and that that cuts across a range of policy areas the declaration talks about education it talks about health it talks about social development and so um I, you know i think it's uh it's I, and the recognition of rights um we don't you know my view is we don't need bill c15 we have the constitution of canada and it, it's 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 those rights are recognized uh you know the inherent um, existing and Aboriginal treaty, Aboriginal and treaty rights of Indigenous people have been have been the law of this land for 30 years. Um, you know, we need to to live up to to our own constitution, um, and and you know, the United Nations Declaration I think reinforces that, um, but it doesn't change fundamentally um, what already exists in Canadian law. Candice or Isabel, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I can't see if you have your hands up, so that's why. I'm Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the. I agree with Danielle. I think that we have the tools, and it's a it's large it's a large and complex document. To be fair, um, it's unfortunate. I think it had just started to really gain some momentum just before the pandemic. So you know, the, I think the pandemic has thrown us all for a little bit of a, you know, like okay, but we're going to be getting back to whatever our new normal is. And certainly when I think about, um, you know, UN DRIP and that, it's, it also includes the interjurisdictional nature of the relationship with Indigenous people and the role of public sector and the role of like all of these roles of, of, of Canadian society coming together on this policy work. And I think pandemic has shined a light on that as well, that we can't do it in isolation and we need to, uh, we need to, you know, just take all of these considerations um, 
you know, as we kind of, you know, poke our heads back out of the, the fog that has been the pandemic. Right. I know that we have a, a question that is um, that has been asked by participants, and I think it's an interesting one. So the participant was asking, recognizing that no one size fits all in terms of co-development concept. What kind of skills do you think a policy advisor should have to ensure you're a change agent? And I like that, a change agent, an innovator and promoter of co-development in Indigenous policy. Uh, Candice, you said you, you might want to answer that? Yeah, sure. No, so this is, this is all, that's such a great and fundamental question to this conversation. You know, so what I've seen, certainly in my experience, and I think we've touched on a couple of things here about, you know, how to engage, you know, understanding the kind of the historical components of where we're coming from, knowing who you're speaking to and with and their realities. And, you know, it's not just a one size fits all, like, are you speaking with Métis Nation? Who are they? Know your uh, partners. Um, you know, know those rights holders that you're talking with. Take the time to learn, to read, to talk to other departments, talk to your colleagues, because at some point someone has had an experience or, or worked with them and they've always got some good, uh, good suggestions. The other thing is, again, don't come from the place of, oh, we can't do that come from the place of how can we make it happen? Like how can, like how can we really try and do some really fun things? And because I find the biggest block to innovation and change is public servants. <laughs> we are our own worst enemy because the system has planned and programmed us to function a certain way. And I kind of like when I see, you know, policy advisors and analysts kind of pushing, pushing those boundaries a little bit you know, obviously there's some rules in place that we do have to think about, but ask and challenge those questions and really open your mind up to new opportunity. To me, if you come in with that positive, you know, let's make some real fun change, then, you know, why not? Let's try it. Mm -hmm. And I probably, Zabed, you would have some good experiences on that, working on the file that you have. Absolutely. And all the nice thing that Candice was referring to that learning, uh, ask question, be curious. I, I think that it's called humility. What you don't know is broad and large. So be humble when you go because there's so much that you're not aware. I'm talking with people that are dealing with their own children, that they're lost them. They are lost in the country. They don't know where they are. And so who are we as policymaker in our ivory tower to come with those, you know, make ideas about here is what a solution for you. So be humble when you start your conversation and accept what is said to you. The other thing that is crucial is transparency. Yeah, we have some rules. There are some, at one point, I will co-develop with you. We will build something together. But at one point, I will have to go into my world and I'll have to write that MC. It will reflect your ideas, but you will likely not see all the words in it. I can't. These are my rules. And I always have some rules. All government have their own rules. So be respectful of those rules. They will be respectful of ours as long as we're not hiding the reality that we're in. So I think that from the get-go, this is the two fundamental things that we have to be careful about. And when you come up with an open heart, and this is what we say about my work, the work that we're doing is tough work, but and complicated and complex, but it's also heart work. And so when you go with this in mind, humble and keen on learning, you will develop the best policy because the intent is good. So be, be yourself, be humble. And then like, yes, we all have the skills. We're all smart. That's fine. That's covered. But you know, it's those human things that are fundamental when you deal with co-development and especially like in, well, I'll just speak for my file, but on file that are so emotional. But that is a good question, though. When a file is so emotional, when you're talking about children, uh, when you talk about health or even education, or uh, maybe even policing and, and incarceration, like it's difficult to be able to expand and um, 
how can I say this? It's not necessarily that you don't want to learn from others, but you we can all, all sometimes be scared of learning because of the implication of what it means and what it means and how we have to change and we have to change the system because of it. And I've seen that also myself uh, when I was working uh, in the rec sec with uh, Danielle and also working at Parse Canada, where we've had uh, sometimes people who would come and say, well, we can't do this. And our CEO would challenge them and say, show me where it says that we can't. But it was an ingrained, unwritten policy. <laughs> and those unwritten policies, I think, are probably what is working mostly against us. Um, and, and I think that we all have them in our different departments. So, um, and talking about all of those policies and, and so on, I mean, for me, policy is very much about uh, reflecting the, the cultures and values of the Canadian society. And as I'm seeing with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and, and people talking more and more about you know, Indigenous rights and Indigenous people, I'm seeing this change in Canadian, in the Canadian public's views and, and in the culture. And people ask me sometimes, do you think that, uh, are you, why are you so optimistic? And I keep saying, because the young people are going to be, not, never, are never going to want to go back to what it was before. So we're going to have to make sure that they have a space at the table where they can see themselves in this new culture that bring, they're bringing up. So I'm wondering uh, what your reflections on that would be if, if, uh, if I'm the only one who thinks this way, or if you've seen that also. Someone tried to get off of mute. <laughs> Candace. Yeah, I'll, t I'll take a stab at that too. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. When we were first starting to talk about the recognition of, of rights and yeah, recognition of rights framework, I think is what it was called for the longest time in the beginning. Uh, it was about how do we change the 92%, which is the 92% the of the Canadian population that have no idea about Indigenous people. And that was the biggest, uh, like, how do you do it in a way that makes sense? And I don't know where that actually ever landed because things kind of um, shifted a little bit, but I do know that there was some concerted efforts on, on changing <sighs> misinformation really and breaking down these assumptions and and you know that is a very difficult conversation and I'm seeing it now even in, in with regards to the pandemic and and vaccine rollout and stuff like how do we change um misunderstanding and, and disinformation um and we're, you know I remember listening to Gina Wilson ask the question not about the, va the vaccine stuff and the pandemic but around that how do we get the, the narrative to change in the general Canadian population and trying to figure out ways that get into and what's the demographic right because it's I find younger people tend because like, we have now all of this wealth of, of information coming out through you know TRC and and and, and missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that we have a the a knowledgeable an open young population so that's it's kind of like how can we make them the influencers you know the agents of change uh in canadian society and and it's, i'm curious to see what's gonna look like in, in you know 20 years from now 30 years from now when they're they're running the world personally i can't wait i think it's going to be good i have a lot of faith we we have a question that's really interesting about uh how to work with elders and uh, I, I think this is uh, an Indigenous uh, public servant. And uh, the person is talking about policy making, and, and it's difficult because of the uh, Canada's Indigenous legislation and policy was to assimilate and eliminate culture and traditions, which, which we've talked about. Uh, and he's asking how uh, we work with elders. So um, Danielle, would you like to, uh, to talk about that a bit? I know you've had quite a bit of experience in that. Sure, yeah. Um, I think it, it, it's really important and I think it's one of the most important things we can do um, as leaders in the public service is to support, you know, the engagement and the participation of elders in our work, both for the benefit of Indigenous public servants, um, but also writ large. And, and I think there are a lot of lessons and, and I've, you know, also didn't grow up with a lot of strong exposure to my culture and so I've really benefited from the time that I've been able to spend with elders as part of my, you know, uh, over the course of my career and as part of my my public service responsibilities. 
Um, and it, it made me think of um, when, when Isabel was just speaking about humility and the kind of skills that we look for in doing this work. I remember, you know, there's, it wouldn't be the I, numerous occasions I can, I can hear elders reminding us, you know, if we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? it, the importance of listening and, and the importance of, um, of humility in what we do. And I think, and, and, you know, a lot of those teachings that have been passed on to me from, from the elders and the knowledge keepers we work with, um, I've tried to incorporate into my own approach to leadership. And I think of the, you know, in particular of the seven teachings, and there are really three um, that guide, you know, me and my own work that I, I really strongly identify with in terms of who I am as a leader and what my, my, um, you know, how I, how I practice as a leader. And it's humility is number one, not being afraid of, uh, uh, of the things we don't know and being open to, um, you know, to that learning and that open spirit and open heart. Um, courage is another one, the courage to challenge the status quo, to ask the tough questions, um, and, you know, to be the voice for people who don't always um, have the opportunity to, to sit at some of the tables I sit at and, and, and to speak up. And then the third one, and this is really, you know, people think this is really hokey. Like, why are you talking about this? But the third one is love. And it, it's, it's that, you know, um, love for what we do, love for our, our people and our communities uh, and for the people we work with and, and how we, we treat each other, um, you know, in, in the workplace. And I think elders can really help ground us in, um, and remind us of those important things. And I think, Natalie, I can't remember if you were there. Um, I think you were in, in the early days of the Reconciliation Secretariat. We had a circle with elders and, um, and I received an eagle feather. And the teaching that came with that was, was the reminder as a leader to use my indigenous tools, not just my public servant tools. And so, um, you know, and I'm really pleased to see, you know, it used to be only INAC had a lodge there's now, um, you know, the site at Agriculture Canada, um, Iskate at Health Canada, and across the country, we're starting to see, um, you know, that the importance of, of cultural supports in the workplace, both for, a, you know, a learning and a mental health perspective. And I think that's been uh, a really positive step forward. Uh, and I think we need to continue to, to grow and, and support that. I agree. I think that quite often as public servants, we think that our network has to be internal, all, all internal, but we have to go out and find that other network also that supports us as public servants. And that gives us that connection to community and, and to people. Uh, and that keeps us in a straight line, I would think. Um, I think that's really important also. Um, and the person is also asking, uh, unless someone else wanted to add something for now, um, the person is also asking, um, although the Act provides the overarching authorities to transfer responsibilities to indigenous organizations, we're still meeting resistance from central agencies to advance this work. I think, Isabel, you probably have some good ideas about that. And then uh, if I can go... Isabel would love to answer this, but I didn't hear the question. So I will try to find it somewhere before answering and passing the torch to one of my panelist friends while I'm digging it. Oh, sorry about that. Did I, did you, did I disconnect or something? I can take it, Natalie, quickly while Thank Isabel you. finds it. Yeah, so for those who didn't hear, there was a question um, with regards to, through the ISC Act provides an overarching authority to transfer responsibilities to Indigenous organizations. We are still meeting resistance from central agencies to advance this work. Shocker. Um, what recommendations could you give to, to move forward with the transfer of responsibilities to Indigenous communities uh, and organizations? Again, that goes back to kind of what I was saying is we have these very rigid structures that we have to continuously push against, right? Um, where it's the central agencies have, to, they're kind of shifting. I remember before and, and folks around here can attest, like PCO was the, oh, like that's where you go. They're like, oh, they will give you all of the blessings and stuff. Things have changed a little bit. So they provide a challenge function and fine, challenge away, but unless there is a fundamental policy that says you may not, I think that we need to continue to challenge them and say, well, what about this? 
where the bigger challenging funds was before was PCO. Now it seems to be more like the Department of Finance, right? Like we're kind of having to battle because it costs money when, you know, Danielle was talking about building up capacity and supporting our organizations that are, you know, that we work with because they don't have the capacity. So they're become more the ones like, you know, really pushing on the money front. Um, PCO again, like they say, they, they're just, they're, they're doing their challenge function, but that's just it. It's a challenge function. So, you know, it, it, you, can, I always recommend you just continue to say, okay, but, and, you know, really lay out your clean argument. Yes. The policy says this, it's a recommendation. It is not, um, law, right? So I might, you know, is it legal, you know, it's constitutional, um, what does it look like politically? Like all of your big things, like continue to lay down that argument and ask and push. That would be my recommendation. I would also add that we've started by saying that we need to change the culture. We need to innovate. We are working in that space days in, days out. Central agencies are not, you know, feeding from the same bread every day as we do. And so that's why like, it's also our role to help PCOs and finance and treasury board changing. And by talking to them regularly and by making sure that they understand our point of view, like it's less, it's less dogmatic than it was, I think. And it's, it's getting a lot easier to actually uh, get them on board with your ideas. Also, it's reconciliation. It's in every uh, mandate letter of all the minister. So if someone is challenging me, I will often say that, okay, so I am actually in line with the reconciliation agenda. So I understand that there might be some adjustment here and there, but the broad and the foundation of the argument might be actually uh, right in line with what's in the letter. So uh, yes, Let's help them change. Let's all work together. We're not perfect, but you know, by changing and by having more conversation, we will uh, we will get there. Yeah, I think just one last comment on on central agencies and their role. I think, like anything else, um, the key is to involve them, involve them early, involve them often. So the work underway at ISC on the new fiscal relationship, Treasury Board and Finance were at the table with the Joint Advisory Committee from day one. So bringing them into the process more um, is important. Learning is important and exposure. And I, I remember um, this was probably six or seven years ago now, We it just happened there was a, a turnover of all of the PCO analysts and the Assistant Secretary Social all at the same time. So they were all new, they were all relatively new to the Indigenous file. And so we offered, and. <laughs> The department's expense, we took them uh, out to Quebec region for a couple of days and they spent a day meeting with the regional office, talking to the RDG about their realities on the ground. And then we drove six hours north uh, and took them into two different communities and, and two different communities that had kind of different circumstances. One from an economic development perspective was doing really well. Another community that was having more challenges. Um, and in that community in particular, there was a new water treatment plant being being built. And this was at the time there were major requests coming forward for infrastructure money and, and helping them understand. And so, you know, we took them up to the hill. It wasn't just the water treatment plant, but they had to dam the river and create a new uh, water intake. And so everybody kind of walked down to the bed of the river and got their shoes all muddy and, you know, and then we went back and met with the DG of the community um, who talked about how they deliver services and just providing that exposure. And you can't, you can't do that in 100% of the cases, but I think it is important uh, when we're working with with central agency partners too, to make sure that um, you know we've we've at least offered the opportunity to help them understand the reality on the ground that those of us who've been working in this field for twenty years or more kind of just take for granted, and we forget that um, not everybody has the same experience and and exposure as we do. On the service transfer question, that's that is another important element, and it is it's a complicated one. So it's a legislative mandate. It, it's a visionary. Uh, aspiration. It's it's going to take you know uh, a generational change, but I'm one of those who's a, who's a true believer, and I think we are going to get there. Um, but the challenge is the landscape is going to look different. We're going to move at a you know in a in a manner and at a pace determined by our partners. There isn't a linear roadmap, right? It's it's more like a topography, and we kind of look at. So one of the things you know internal um, 
to ISC and through conversations with our partners is we are trying to start to frame out um, or to map out that broader policy framework that will guide service transfer. And so it'll, it, again, as a tool that's going to help us communicate to partners what service transfer can look like, help central agencies have that common understanding. And so that work is underway, um, you know, internal, you know, across the department and involving uh, various ISC sectors. So I don't know who, who is asking the question if you're at ISC, but if you want to follow up and learn more about the work we're doing on service transfer, just uh, drop me an email. Thank you for that. They probably will. <laughs> that's a very interesting one. And, and one that's that's changing constantly, right? And evolving. So I think it's important to, to keep on top of it. Um, so one of the questions that we have, and I don't know, I don't know, I wouldn't, I'm going to start by saying I wouldn't be able to answer this question uh, because I, I don't know. So I'm going to put it out there and maybe it's just a discussion that we can have. But um, so it's more about Indigenous people living, living in urban areas and how UNDRIP can, um, can affect them or can help them out also. And if you have examples of situations where you have seen or you think we might see where UNDRIP uh, could be uh, helpful for urban Indigenous peoples. Does anybody have any ideas, Candice? Sure, happy to jump in on this one. So this goes, I um, I think I'm gonna actually hit Danielle up by email to find out what's going on with the service transfer, just because I'm curious. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, no, on the question, this is, oh, such an important question. Oof. So this is something I've struggled with, with the whole definition and when we started using distinctions-based. Because again, dis rights are tied to the individual, not the land, right? So when we talk about, um, indigenous rights, rights follow you where you go. Um, but it depends if you want to have access to, like if you're First Nations, you want access to, you know, reserved lands and you have to be, you know, uh, status and um, et cetera, et cetera. What we see happening, and certainly my experience in particular, when we talk about distinctions-based programming, is that we create inadvertently a potential gap for those uh, who live or who are, are disassociated from or enfranchised from uh, their, their communities. You know, when I think about, um, you know, Bill C-31, C-3, S-3, there's whole generations of people in particular in the First Nations context who have never seen their reserve or who they attach to now all of a sudden have this reconstitution of a right because of, you know, breaking down uh, a lot of the Indian Act policies, 1951 cutoff, et cetera. The challenge is, though, when we do distinctions-based programming and policy is we put authority in the hands of leadership. The leadership then decides, in particular when it comes to access to funding, access to programming, the leadership then decides, rightfully so, because they are the rights holders' leadership. That's the collective versus the individual I was talking about, where the money is going to go. So historically, and I think about Aboriginal Head Start in my, in, you know, at the public health agency, there's a problem just in urban environments. But with this new Indigenous IELCC work going on, we want to transfer the funding to First Nations leadership, tends to be tied to reserve. There's a whole urban swath of, of populations who have no connection. Um, so how do we continue to provide support? And I think for me, and again, happy to open this up to debate, is it is my responsibility, certainly within as a public servant, to ensure that there is some sort of support for those populations, that we're not further expanding the gap for those um, people who live in urban environments, or in just even rural remote who are not necessarily attached to a particular reserve or, or not recognized by the Métis Nation or not, you know, et cetera, et cetera, urban uh, Inuit people who leave Inuit Nudengat come into urban environments, is there is there money and support systems? I kind of feel like that's where we have a like we have a role to play there because you know communities also are still kind of grappling with what this means for themselves, and I know leadership is grappling what it means for themselves and how they're gonna the balance uh, balance meeting the the needs of all their populations. So I kind of feel like that, and maybe that's that's certainly my perspective and I, as people that I've met with too is we have a role to play there to because again it's for the health and safety and well being of all people. So if there's a gap there, then we have a place to play and to support. I'll stop there. So my follow up question on that would be, and, and I agree with what you're saying, 
um, what is the role then of the leadership in the communities uh, towards these people who are now living in urban areas? Do you think that the, 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 the responsibility is co-share or um, because I hear often where leadership will say, uh, well, we're developing the, this policy for our constituents, uh, whether they're on reserve or off, off reserve, but we know that off reserve um, or urban Indigenous people are, they, they're not in the same situation. So how would you see that uh, play out then? Did you want to go, Danelle, or? I was just going to say, I don't know if, it, if, if we can comment on what leadership should or shouldn't be doing, um, but I think we can ask what, what we as public servants can and, and should be doing to make sure that we're um, you know, looking broadly at the at the diverse needs of, of very diverse populations in different circumstances across the country. And it, it, it gets into that question of, you know, distinctions based approaches. Uh, I think, you know, there's been a some significant accomplishments with, you know, through the bilateral processes, the advancing the relationship in particular with the Métis Nation with Inuit with First Nations in a way that recognizes their distinct history, culture, experiences, priorities. But at the same time, uh, so while that distinction space should probably always be our starting point, uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that we also consider voices who might not be at the table. And so, you know, whether it's women, urban, LGBTQ2IA, uh, the Métis that fall outside the Métis Nation, and that's where I think, you know, tools like um, the GBA Plus Suite, when we look at intersectionality, um, can be helpful in making sure that whatever you know, program or initiative or, or policy that we're advancing um, is inclusive and that, you know, or if, you know, if it comes down to issues around program eligibility and jurisdiction, uh, that we're very clear in, in our language and in our intention about, um, you know, the scope of, of what would be, um, you know, who, who will benefit um, and to be as, as inclusive and, and um, equitable as possible in our approaches. And that's something I think through the pandemic um, you know, we've also really seen, um, and, and I think, in, you know, there, it, it's been quite effective in terms of influencing not just the federal government, you know, but influencing provinces and territories, for example, to, to prioritize vaccination of Indigenous people. Um, the Indigenous Community Support Fund approach, which, which provided allocation, uh, you know, to distinctions-based groups uh, and to others to, to develop solutions and responses that were going to work um, in a way that that address their own unique circumstances as opposed to kind of one size fits all, um, you know, blanket approaches. Mm -hmm. And talking about the pandemic, how has that affected your work, uh, especially when we're talking about co-development and working with Indigenous groups? Uh, there must have been some impact in, in uh, what you're doing and taking into consideration some of the, uh, you know, the issues that some communities have, especially up north with uh, internet connection and so on. Um, I don't know, Isabel, do you have any? Uh... Of course it has an impact. Uh, while there's a significant interest from communities to exercising jurisdiction, uh, they have a priority which is called pandemic. So you have the priorities that Danielle was referring to as the first crucial element. Then of course there's the technology. Uh, there's where there's some communities that we have no problem connecting with, uh, you know, like this, but some others it's more complex and we might not have the uh, engagement as much as we want. We had to postpone some of the engagement that we wanted to do, not only because the technology, but it's the overall, because let's all face it, you don't have that connection, that, that connection that uh, Danielle was referring to, that is so crucial. When you're talking about children that are like the essence of a culture, so there's there's a bit that connection. People are getting adjust to discussing uh, in these forum, but it had an impact and it adds to the delay. Delay doesn't mean that we're pushing that and oh sorry I'm on an agenda because you know according to the government I should be there. You know the rules that Candice was referring to and that Danielle was saying oh oh my line is there we need to show flexibility and this is what we are doing. So does it take more time? Yes. Does that mean that we will not engage or that we will say that I will not co-develop because you know, there's that pandemic? Absolutely not. It, it's, it's 
actually reinforce our interest and our desire and our commitment to communities to co-develop with them. And again, it works well, and we've made it work where relationships are already well established, where they're already functioning. Just this morning, we had the fourth annual um, Inuit Crown Partnership meeting with the Prime Minister and the Inuit leadership. And I mean, there's no part of the country that struggles more with connectivity than Inuit Nunanga. But it was on Zoom, and it, and it worked. And you could tell between the ministers and the leaders, they already had a rapport that they built up over the last four years, and, and it worked. When you're starting something new, uh, and I've got a couple of files now where we're trying to start something new, uh, it's a lot more challenging um, because you don't have that relationship. You don't, so to start that in a virtual environment is, is gonna be tricky. Having a virtual coffee with someone is not always easy, but sometimes it can work. <laughs> um, so the department uh, has split and um, sometimes it's seen as you know a key milestone by, by public servants. Some. So based on your experience, um, do, you, do our partners care about the departmental structure and what are the actual benefits of the departmental split, do you think? That's a great question. <laughs> I can mm -hmm. tackle it, but I'm sure every, everyone has, has views on that. Um, you know, based on my experience, I'm not sure um, how much partners care about the machinery. I think what they do care about is having access, you know, to ministers, having a public service that's responsive, uh, you know, to their needs and their interests. Um, I think certainly during the pandemic, um, you know, my observation is we never, never would have had uh, the kind of integrated, coordinated pandemic response that we've had, had FINIB still been part of Health Canada, just having our FINIB colleagues and our regional operations colleagues working side by side with a you know, common approach to emergency management. Um, you know, you, the statistics that Minister Miller uh, tweeted, tweeted out this morning, since January, the, the COVID, rate of COVID infection in Indigenous communities has dropped 85% in the last four months, which is quite remarkable. And a lot of that is, is thanks to the strong leadership in communities, but a lot of it is, is you know, a result of the hard work of our colleagues as well. So I think in some ways those machinery changes are, and you know, the bureaucracy should never be the story, right? What happens behind the scenes uh, isn't what's important. What's important is are we achieving results and and are we getting, you know, to the outcomes that, that we'd like to see. For some, I'm sure for partners, it's confusing who does what, but I think what they see is now two really strong ministers uh, with the, you know, engagement of the Prime Minister who are interested in, in moving these files forward and, and Minister Vandal in the North as well. Um, and so, you know, I think it, you know, we'll, we'll, I think it's been helpful for the departments in terms of having more dedicated and discrete focus on, on the service transfer that, you know, the future oriented, how do we transfer jurisdiction while CERNA maintains, you know, the ongoing relationship and the role of the Crown, which is going to be enduring. Um, but it's still a work in progress, really, you know, culture change is hard, institutional change is harder. Uh, and it, you know, it's still very much a work in progress, but it's, it sparked some really important conversations and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of work that I think we can be proud of. Mm -hmm. Candice, did you want to add anything or Isabel? I, just to echo what, da what Danielle's saying, I don't think that there's really been unless it's like more, probably more senior leadership, I'd say that would have spoken to the split of the organization. But when it comes down to the like the hands-on brass tacks, uh, it's the ISK for me, I think it was, oh my gosh, we can finally split out the relationship and the service and actually achieve transfer and get out of the business, right? And I think by just by doing that, you get rid of all the messiness, which relationships bring, they bring relationship bring messy. Um, so by splitting it out, um, <laughs> I was thinking like, that's why you don't get married. No, I'm uh, sorry, I shouldn't say this, that's good. Marriage is lovely. Um, but that's why you, you, you split it out. You can have the relationship kind of contained where, and I say relationship, I mean, relationships, litigation, you know, all of that stuff is over there. And these are the people who get our rubber hits the road and let's get with it. And how are we going to get out of the business and bang on Danielle? I agree completely with the pandemic. It, I was so proud to be at that department at ISK 
when I saw my, you know, FINEB colleagues and, and Val, uh, Gideon and folks there every day, long hours, day in and day out and kudos, kudos, kudos to them. Man, did they just do such a brilliant job. And because FINEB was right there, it just seemed, I couldn't have imagined what it would have been like when we were all kind of spread out everywhere. So yeah, totally agree on that one. I think one thing it does too, is it breaks us out of that idea of a linear continuum of, you know, Indian Act to self-government as defined by federal policy. What it what it really gives us the, the flexibility and creativity to do is to recognize there's more than one path to self-determination and communities are gonna determine for themselves what path they wanna take, whether that's drawing down jurisdiction over child and family services, or whether it's working with CERNA to negotiate a full you know, self-government agreement and modern treaty. Uh, and one doesn't preclude the other and that there's, there's you know, I think it's expanded the realm of choices uh, and pathways for, for communities. Mm. I think we have one last question and I might ask Isabel this, um, or, but if anybody wants to add in also, and then I'm going to ask you to think about this. I'd like the one message that you would like participants to leave with um, at the end. So uh, do you think that the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission has really brought a change between uh, uh, Indigenous peoples and the rest of Canadians? Uh, or, um, I'm sorry, I'm translating as I'm going. Uh, do you think that the policies are more regarding as, um, you know, getting to know, uh, getting to know a people and if they're really that important? probably have not translated that very well. Sorry. That's pretty much what it was. But I think that fundamentally, it sets the stage for a, a new beginning. It will take time, but there is indeed a lot more awareness, a lot more uh, education that is being brought. I'll be very honest here and transparent. I've never been told a lot of stories myself about Indigenous. So there's that lack of knowledge that you young people, my kids, they did not know anything. And now you see that courses and curriculum at school are being broader. And this is where it can start. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But, you know, slowly but surely by expanding exposure, there will be some changes that will that will apply. And I will leave the two experts there talking about this more than I do. So perfect. And Isabel, before we go, what is the one message that we, you would like participants to go away with from your experiences in this domain? Well, uh, look at here. I am a non-Indigenous working in Indigenous file and it can be scary. It was. There's a ton of knowledge and I am, I'm considering myself to be lucky to work in this field. And so don't be afraid, don't be scared of not knowing and being true to yourself by uh, expressing this will give you so much, uh, will broaden your perspective and you will be able to make some better to provide some better advice because of this. So yes, it could be scary, and uh, but don't worry, to, don't don't be afraid. That's the main thing that I want to say here. Super. Merci beaucoup, Isabelle Miguich. Candice, I'm going to go to you next. Oh, I caught me off guard there. I was just thinking, what what do I want to say other than wear a mask, wash your hands, uh, social distance. Um, so. Um, I, I agree. I think that there is, it has, the the commission has really brought an awareness, right? And finally, kind of a, 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 a discourse that's happening. Uh, there's a discourse across Canada, um, even internationally, I'd say. Um, and so that's good. We want to continue that discourse. The messaging, I was like, what would I tell people? Okay, well, so be brave in your advice, be humble in your relationships, and be curious and ask questions. Be respectful always be respectful to everybody regardless of who they are but i think that you know if you're brave in your you know advice that you're giving to ministers in in the policies that you're proposing but you're humble to the advice that you're and information you're getting from your partners be grateful for that and, and just be respectful of, of the people that they're sharing their wisdom they're sharing their experiences because a lot of it is 
extremely intimate uh, to, to an individual and they, you know, to come to them and ask them questions, which they probably have been asked 50 million times, uh, you know, just be grateful that they're willing to spend the time with you and, and you know, be thankful and thank your elders and, and uh, you know, seek that advice from them too. So with that, miigwech. Miigwech, Candice. Danielle? Last word. Um, so both that last question and uh, and the takeaway makes me think, Natalie, of all of the, the time that we had the immense privilege to work with Grand Chief Willie Littlechild on the National Council for Reconciliation when we worked together. And if, if you don't know Chief Willie or you, you've never heard him speak, um, go Google him and find some of his, uh, you know, I'm sure he's on YouTube and all over the place. But one of the things um, he would always say, and, and again, you know, from our thinking about what we what we learn from our leaders and our elders, is he was one of the commissioners at the TRC, and he said, you know, when we wrote that those calls to action in particular, it was deliberate. The order from one to ninety four is not accidental, um, and they started with the things that they felt were the most urgent and the most important to address, um, and those first four or five elements largely our federal responsibility and it's incumbent on us as public servants to move that forward and I think you know and, and I, looking at, around the room so Isabel the first section was about the child welfare system child and family services one to six the next section was about education indigenous languages health the justice system and then into the rights and relationship and, and the UN declaration so we've kind of covered that landscape today but then if you look beyond that Call to Action 57 is about public servants and, and our responsibility to educate ourselves about Indigenous history, to be aware of our biases uh, in our work. And then there are calls to other sectors of society, to the media, to the legal profession, to the medical profession, to the sport community, to immigration and, and new Canadians. And so when we think about the calls to action, it wasn't a, you know, a set of recommendations for the federal government to accept or not accept. It was, a, it was a generational call for change and we're on the front line of it. And so as public servants, we all have that responsibility um, you know, and, and to take our duties seriously when it comes to, to recognition of rights, respect, cooperation and partnership. And so I think that's the thing I'd like people to take away is a sense of you know, hopefully having learned something and um, another shameless plug for the Indigenous Learning Series. There's some great material there that was developed with a Council of Elders guiding, uh, guiding the work, but also to understand that we all have a role to play and, and to, to think about how, how you play that role in, in your day-to-day -day work. Thank you very much. Well, you've actually done the shameless plug for me, so. <laughs> Um, I know that we've received a lot of questions that we have not had a chance to go through, so I'm sorry, but thank you so much for the participants, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, answer your questions one way or another. And I wanted to really thank uh, the three uh, panelists because uh, you have enriched this conversation to no end, uh, your experiences and your willingness to share. Thank you so much. Um, your feedback is really important for us as we uh, finish this session. So you, you're going to be receiving uh, an email from us. If you could fill it out, that would be really, really appreciated. And another shameless plug, I just wanted to let you know about our next event, which is um, it's going to be on May 26th during Indigenous Awareness Week. So uh, you've all heard of the TED Talks. Well, we have the Elder Talks. And uh, they're really interesting when we have an elder who comes and talks about different things. So this one is going to be Dr. Reg Croshu, and uh, he'll be talking about storytelling. Um, so thank you. This is something that I think a lot of people are interested in. Um, so thank you for this. We really appreciate uh, you having taken time, uh, both panels and the participants, and uh, looking forward to uh, having a chance to discuss this further with all of you. Thank you, Miigwech and Willalim.